welcome everybody. Thanks for everybody who came back and everybody who's here newly. Um, I just want to give a little brief intro before uh, Megan gives the intro to Manuel in the bio. But um, Manuel Otero Brew has been with us from day one, Cassandra 2020 classrooms, Alternative History of Abstraction 101. Um, Manuel's theoretical practice uh, just continues to amaze me. Um, they're one of the theorists and writers that I, and thinkers, <laughs> Uh, that I get the most pleasure out of, especially, um, you know, rewatching the courses, rewatching the conversations. Um, I think they genuinely engage with history in a way that um, I think we will see start to formulate the basis of a lot of institutional practice praxis in the future. Uh, I hope also, um, and I just wanted to read the course description for Manuel's upcoming course, Carib Caliban. Uh, Carib Caliban Cannibal, The Colombian Encounter and Resistance Forms of Life, which is going to be a six-week course that we're offering two hour weekly sessions of starting on the 17th of May, uh, instructed by Manuel. So we're presenting Carib Caliban Cannibal, The Colombian Encounter and Resistance Forms of Life, a six-week course exploring the European colonial projection of cannibalism onto indigenous Carib people and sub-Saharan Africans, and the latter's resistance to this consumption. In six weekly sessions, including a screening, reading group, music listening session, and writing workshop, uh, we'll consider Col Columbus's distinction between cannibal, carob, and peaceful Arawak, the colonial Catholic aesthetic, the development of syn syncretism between African indigenous and Catholic ontologies, and finally, Afro-Caribbean forms of resistance to the colonial order. We'll consider both sociopolitical spatial formations as well as aesthetics of resistance, maroon settlements, menial, um, Palenque, and Quilombo, mutual aid societies, Cofreda, Hermanada, uh, Yucayeca, and the enchantment of consumption. Waves such as Haitian spiralism destabilize the European origin myth, notions of formal and racial purity, and the ideas of an original being within favor of a ritual consumption of basis, bias, it, bias that unearths the nonlinear philosophy of time of the Caribbean arts and the imagination, as Wilson Harris puts it. From 19th century Haiti writers, Ignatius Now, Marvelous Real, to the 20th century Mar Martician writer, Suzanne, um, Suzanne Césaire's literary cannibalism, to what theorist Paul Marshall called kitchen poetics, the contemporary Haitian spiralism that Afro-Caribbean mythopoetic traditions tend attend to ritual and discursive elements which push, push back on ritual ritually consume and or ritually consume, <laughs> push back on or ritually consume the Caliban figure, Shakespeare's half human, half monster character in The Tempest, 1610. The first play about the Caribbean, who can all, only curse his master Prospero. <clears throat> what Antiguan philosopher calls Caliban's reason will drive out inquiry in weekly two hour sessions facilitated by a brew and a teaching assistant. And that text was by Manuela Brew, and we hope to see you in the course. And I have the great pleasure of listening in person to the first time, uh, I think for a lecture in person for the first time today, and I'm really excited, super happy that y'all came, and let Megan introduce Manuel a little bit further. Class and uh, course registration ends May 10th. Class starts May 17th. Take it. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Candice. Those who weren't here earlier or don't already know her, that's Candace Williams, the founder of Cassandra Press. My name is Megan Hoyer. I'm the director of public programs and public engagement here at the Whitney. Um, and this is the second of two lectures we are presenting today with Cassandra Press on the occasion of their inclusion in the Whitney Biennial 2022, Quiet As It's Kept. Um, if you're just joining us, if you're joining us online, I just want to remind everyone you can access closed captioning by turning on this feature in the options bar in Zoom. And um, thank you, Kara from Sign Nexus, for providing the captions. Um, so I feel like I don't need to introduce Cassandra Classrooms or Cassandra Press after that. What what Candice just shared because it's that was like an example of it in in action. But um, I will. Um, just briefly say 
Um, Cassandra Press is an artist-run publishing and educational platform which produces lo-fi printed matter, classrooms, projects, artist books, and exhibitions. Their installation here at the Whitney is right outside of the theater, so hopefully those of you who are here um, have had a chance to spend some time with it. Um, and it, there, it's so rich and there's so much to read, so it also come back to spend more time with it. Um, and the program today aims to share the work of Cassandra Classrooms, um, an ongoing pedagogical practice that spreads ideas, distributes new language, and propagates dialogue centering ethics, aesthetics, femme-driven activism, and black scholarship. So we're about to hear a lecture by Emmanuel Arturo Abreu, which distills a course that he's been offering um, called Zombie Fear of a Black Republic. For this course, Abru uses film footage and critical analysis to discuss the development of the anti-black zombie trope in literature, cinema, and video games from its origins in the wake of Haiti's liberation by means of voodoo to its current deracialized form. Following the lecture, which will be about 45 minutes, um, and while we'll take some questions, and then um, you're invited to stay with us for a screening of Debajo del Agua, the wake work of Enerol Enerolisa, I'm sorry, I didn't check that with you, Manuel, Enerolisa Nunez, a film um, which he's made, they've made. So um, Manuel Arturo Abreu is a non-disciplinary artist. They use what is at hand in a process of magical thinking with attention to ritual aspects of aesthetics. They co-founded Home School, a free pop-up art school in Portland, Oregon, um, in its sixth year of genre non-conforming edutainment curriculum. Ebru also composes club feasible worship music as Tabor Dark, and they are the author of List Consonants, Trans Trender, and Incalculable Loss. Um, those are all book titles. Um, so one final note, um, again, if you're here in person, um, restrooms are located outside of the theater on this floor. Um, if you need to exit for any reason during the program, please use the doors at the back of the room where you entered. And without further ado, I'm so happy to have Manuel Arturo Abreu. Hey, all. Thanks for being here. Hopefully, uh, you can hear me OK. I'm going to give a little talk, and then we're going to watch a movie. Uh, this talk serves as an intro to the coloniality of the Hollywood zombie trope. And the video is about a Dominican spiritual and cultural worker and musician who uh, kind of rejects the uh, colonial anti-black rendering that uh, is pertinent in this kind of anti-Haitian concept of the zombie. So I start out with some memes. Uh, this is like one of my promotional images for the course. We've got zombie Jerry Saltz, zombie conceptualism, and Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who completed the Haitian Revolution after Toussaint was killed by Napoleon. We can see him here cutting off holding a cut off white head and uh, holding a, sh a scimitar. So yeah, what if I told you that the zombie trope comes from fear of a black republic? Red pill, blue pill. Uh, the Hollywood zombie emerges from the US occupation of Haiti uh, from 1915 to 34 and draws on tropes developed during earlier colonial encounter, such as fetish and cannibal. I detail the cannibal tropes coloniality in the upcoming Cassandra course, so I'm super excited about that. And uh, actually, the first thing that I did with Cassandra was the inclusion of the uh, Is Theorizing Cannibalism Ethical essay in the Reader on Cannibalism. So I'm super excited to kind of come full circle around this. Um, black Twitter. And yeah, cannibalism of TikTok and Black Twitter, right? <laughs> I, that's, that was even earlier than that, damn. Yeah. <laughs> Years in the making. But uh, the earliest, or the earlier Hollywood zombie, uh, such as in uh, White Zombie from 1932, I Walked with a Zombie from 1944. Black Moon from 1935, et cetera. Uh, the earlier Hollywood zombie stays connected to Vodou in Haiti, but with George Romero's Night of the Living Dead in 68, we get the modern zombie, a lifeless cannibal automaton with seemingly, seemingly no relation to the Afro-Caribbean. So here the shift is from uh, soul control by a local zombie master to uh, you know, someone that could be infected by a virus or from something in space or from a scientific experiment gone wrong. So we see a shift uh, to that kind of modern concept of the zombie, but cannibalism as a kind of colonial uh, trope or resource uh, is like consistent throughout. Uh, since the beginning of the colonial encounter, however, African and indigenous resistance has persisted, 
And since the Hollywood zombie, various Caribbean aesthetic waves emerged, which reappropriated the zombie and cannibal to shed light on the region, uh, the Caribbean, as central to modernity. So as Candace mentioned in the uh, cannibal, Carib Caliban cannibal class description, uh, movements such as Suzanne Cesaire's literary cannibalism, uh, Brazilian antropofagismo, uh, Haitian Andijan and spiralism, Wilson Harris's quantum fiction and others, um, Paul Marshall's kitchen poetics, et cetera. So that specifically is dealt with uh, toward the end of the lecture. First thing I do is talk about the zombie. So I just wanted to talk about some of the classes I did with Cassandra. The first one was the Alternative History of Abstraction 101. This is a rejection of the European origin myth of modernism uh, as starting in the early 20th century movements and instead focusing on what I call the alternative history of abstraction, uh, black and brown, Asian and indigenous abstraction uh, that is much older and through the kind of dehumanization and kitchification uh, through colonization became like resources for European modernism, like Candace detailed with Picasso. Uh, the zombie course, this is kind of what I'm talking about today. Uh, we deconstruct the colonial zombie and cannibal trope, which has become one of the most productive genres in contemporary media. And in this course, uh, we read René de Pest, C.L.R. James, Sarah Loro, Ashil Bembe, Sylvia Winter, Orlando Patterson, Paul Gilroy, Joy James, and many others. I love this class because it's a mix of high and low. We watch really shitty movies, but then we also read really dense theory, so it's just a nice mix. Um, it's a mongrel class. And then upcoming course, Carib, Caliban, Cannibal, The Colombian Encounter and Resistant Forms of Life. So Candace already read the description. I'll move forward from that. So yeah, Etym Online, the uh, online etymology dictionary, gives the following etymology for zombie, uh, attested as early as 1871, of West African origin, so compare Kikongo Zumbi fetish and Kimbundu Nzambi god. Originally the name of a snake god, later with meaning reanimated corpse in voodoo cult, sense slow-witted person, recorded from 1936. Uh, but there's a much earlier tradition which has to do, do with the uh, conversation between the Portuguese colonizers and the kings of the Congo kingdom. Um, and Zambi as a concept of the high creator god is a way of mediating some of these colonial impasses in uh, ontology and epistemology. So in the next slide, we look at a catechism from 1624 in Portuguese and the medieval southern Kikongo dialect translation by the Portuguese uh, missionaries. This is the first printed book in a Bantu language to have survived. There's only three copies in the world right now uh, that I know of. Uh, it's called Doctrina Cristiana de Novo Traducida, La Lingua de Reino de Congo, Lisbon, 1624. And so we'll see here that Sambiampungu is used for God so if you look on the farther, far right, uh, you can kind of see some of the uses of Sambian Pungu. So yeah, basically the idea here that is that Zambi has something to do with the colonial encounter between uh, the Catholics and both Bantu, but also Fon Eve uh, theologies. Fon Eve theologies from Dahomey are the basis of Bodun. So yeah, starting with Portugal's arrival in West Africa, specifically Senegal in 1440, and then later with Spain's arrival in the Caribbean in 1492, Catholic colonizers developed concepts like fetish or fetisho, which is the capricious belief in the agency of inanimate objects, and cannibal. Uh, Columbus, as Candace mentioned, distinguished between peaceful Arawaks and cannibal Caribs, the latter uh, being the Caribbean's namesake. And then starting in 1804 with the success of the Haitian Revolution, the means of which, as Cedric Robinson said, was Vaudun, Western powers feared that their colonies would be next. Along with the imposition of French debt of 150 million francs on Haiti, the West also drew on anti-black, anti-indigenous concepts of fetish and cannibal to demonize Vaudun and the first black republic. So they portrayed the island as backward, savage, fearsome. So we can talk about resistance. Um, really, even in 1493, the Taino killed all of the people in the uh, Fort Christmas that Columbus built, but speaking specifically about Afro-Caribbean resistance, we can look to 1522. Uh, the enslaved Wolofs forced to work Columbus's son, Diego Columbus's plantation in Santo Domingo, took up the mantle of resistance begun by the indigenous Caribbeans in 1493. And so we get this idea of maroon colonies, right? So people who escape Spanish colonists to initiate fugitive experiments in living free uh, in remote mountain areas and so these indigenous people would later be joined by Africans fleeing enslavement. Uh, the first one we know of is by Huarocuya or Enriquillo, who began a revolt 
uh, in the Bahuruko Maroon community in 1519. Um, and so some of the Wolofs actually joined the Bahuruko Maroon community and assisted with various revolts, uh, such as that by the enslaved Wolofs. The resistance was ongoing and resilient, both in Maroon communities and in mutual aid societies, in particular the Cofradias for the Holy Spirit and John the Baptist. I'll speak more about these aid societies later. Here's a 16th century depiction of the Wolof Rebellion on Diego Colón's Ingenia, or plantation. So another form of resistance was religious syncretism, spiritual practices mixed together, but also arrived already mixed. Certain Congo monarchs, like Alfonso I uh, in 1491, had converted to Christianity by choice. And some of the Catholic mutual aid societies that uh, characterized very early spiritual practice on the island, these are called cofradías, were actually founded in Spain. Uh, Portugal's 1440 arrival in Central and West Africa leads to the development of the concept of fetiche alongside Catholic icons and heterodox idols. There's now the idea of capricious objects seen as magical by Africans that the Portuguese and Dutch encountered, which from the very beginning resisted colonial settlement and used material and spiritual practices to stymie Portugal and later Spain's empire building. Those savvy merchants, fierce warriors, freedom seekers, and inscrutable sages who impeded the colonists frustrated them to no end. Haitian Vodou and Dominican Voodoo, or uh, Ventuna de Visiones, are a mix of Foneve, Congo, Yoruba, Amer indigenous, Abrahamic, and spiritist practices. By the 1500s, Spaniards had drastically reduced the population of indigenous Caribbeans of the island of Haiti, commonly called Tainos. Not really correct. Uh, a friar named Bartolomé de las Casas pleaded to the crown of Castile to, uh, rather than enslave indigenous people, enslave and import enemies of Christ. So Moors, Muslims, Sephardic Jews, and uh, you know, other people who had encountered the doctrine but rejected it, uh, such as from Portugal slavery settlements in Africa. So this was a kind of a, he thought that the Ar African slaves and Moorish and Muslim and Sephardic slaves were justly acquired. And so he kind of argued that the indigenous people should be left alone in favor of taking these justly acquired slaves. But obviously we know that wasn't the case, so he ended up uh, kind of rejecting his own position, unfortunately. But by the time he realized that he was wrong, it was, it was too late, obviously. Um, the Spaniards had access to Central and West African colonial settlements, thanks to Portugal. So yeah, um, Cofradia, or Emandaji in Portuguese. This is a Catholic mutual aid society. Um, it's a religious network of people who care for each other. Uh, and many of these Cofradias took place in uh, maroon war camps, uh, which in Arawak is called Maniel or Manie. In medieval Kikongo is called Quilombo. And then in Spanish, Palenque. These are all the same meaning. Uh, words for maroon settlements that waged war against the colonial and plantation metropole. Many were structured after West and Central African rural systems, such as Quilombo dos Palmares in Brazil. And in this war camp, founded by Menekongo uh, Ganga Zumba, Menekongo is a uh, Congo word for king, uh, Ganga Zumba uh, founded this colony, and the second king in particular is remembered for his resistance against the Portuguese and Dutch colonizers. So this is his nephew, Sumi dos Palmares. So here's a poster for the Brazilian film, Ganga Zumba. And then here's a bust of his nephew, uh, Sumi dos Palmares, in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. The dedication, dedication plate reads, Sumi dos Palmares, o líder negro de todas as razas, which in English says, Sumi dos Palmares, the black leader of all the races. Here's a map of the Manieles in uh, Haiti and DR, uh, circa 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. So the black shaded areas are where these maroon war camps had been settled. And you can't see it here because there's no terrain or topography uh, indexed, but all of these regions have mountainous terrain that makes it hard to get to. And here's a basic cosmogram from uh, the Bu Congo or Congo religion. There's a line called Kalunga that separates the material and immaterial or spiritual world. There's a line that connects those two worlds called Potomitan, and there's a counterclockwise uh, life cycle connecting the living and the dead, or the material and immaterial. So obviously I talk about this more in the class. 
uh, cofradías are Catholic mutual aid societies, medieval cofradías founded in Spain and the Christianized Congo, established themselves in colonial metropoles of Haiti early in the 16th century. Some of the most popular were for the Holy Spirit and St. John the Baptist. Enslaved Amer indigenous and African Caribbeans used the cofradía mutual aid system to survive physically and also to syncretically attempt to retain aspects of their spirituality with Catholicism as a kind of medium. Aspects of Arawak, Bantu Congo, Fon Ewe, Yoruba, Catholic, and Islamic theology became enmeshed in Haiti in a way that corresponded to and built on the syncretism that began on the African mainland uh, in a variety of lineages. And the two most recognizable lineages are the Asogwe lineage in Port-au-Prince and the Cha-Cha lineage of Capetien, Northern Haiti, and DR. So here's a saint's procession from the Cofradia of the Holy Spirit of the Congo, so Villa Meja and the capital of DR, Santo Domingo. So yeah, um, the Haitian Revolution, which is really kind of where this anti-zombie trope, or this anti-black zombie trope begins, um, was led by enslaved African and mixed masses of the French colony of Saint-Domingue, seeking liberation by any means necessary, as well as critical leaders like Macandal the Poisoner, uh, Dati Boukman, Cecil Fatiman, and Toussaint Louverture. It led to the first free black republic in the New World, and Haiti continues to be harshly punished for this by European powers, both, both financially and culturally. So we've got the, uh, the debt that France imposes of 150 million francs, but then also the, what Raphael Herman calls the Haitian Gothic, the idea that black religion that was the means of the first black republic is cannibalistic and savage, et cetera. Uh, so building on fetish and cannibal concepts from earlier uh, colonial encounter. While much has been made of the Enlightenment component of the revolution, we can read uh, the Black Jacobins as a great example of this. Toussaint Louverture thought of himself as a black Frenchman and believed in uh, the French Enlightenment ideals of liberté, fraternité, equalité. Um, but the spiritual component is equally important, especially with the masses. Uh, with the poisoner Macandal and others as his important predecessors, the revolution starts on the night of a sacred ceremony, a Vaudon ceremony called Bois Caiman on the 14th of August, 1791. Here's a depiction by Dudonné Sedo. So there's a sacrifice of a black Creole pig in the middle. You can see the ceremonial uh, sigils on the ground called Vévés. People are holding ceremonial machetes and vessels filled with water. Um, any Catholic person knows that a cup full of water is a spirit vessel. Again, Dessaline on the left, um, holding a severed white head, and then on the right, uh, this is the cover of Gerald Horn's book about the foundation of the Dominican Republic called Confronting Black Jacobins. And it's a depiction of uh, Dessalines' command to hang white people. And you see two uh, hung folks, a couple more in the back, but the two in the front are the clearest. Here's uh, an unknown artist's depiction of the, uh, the destruction of the um, sugar mills in Capesien. Um, the caption says, on the French colony of Saint-Domingue, black slaves, through unending brutality, think to win conceded French democratic freedoms. <laughs> they ruin many hundreds of coffee and sugar plantations and burn the mills. They indiscriminately slaughter all of the whites which fall into their hands, even using a white child as their flag, disgracing women and dragging them away to miserable prisons. Here's Jean Lorraine's depiction of Catherine Flon, who sewed the Haitian flag. This painting is from 2013. So yeah, how do we go from the fear of a black republic in the wake of the Haitian Revolution, um, which just to put into context was so uh, foundational that the Louisiana Purchase uh, came as a result of it. France was so uh, decimated financially that it had to sell a bunch of its territory for pennies on the dollar to the US. Um, how do we go from the Haitian Revolution to the zombie, right? The modern zombie trope, uh, the cannibal automaton of Romero, bears little resemblance to its roots and fears about Vaudou and the First Black Republic. In the wake of the Haitian Revolution, Vaudou was portrayed as cannibalistic. Uh, the need to civilize black Haitians was one among many justifications for US occupation in 1915. One of the people that was part of this uh, settlement, W.G. Seabrook, uh, wrote a book called The Magic Island in 1929. He did, quote unquote, anthropology in Haiti uh, and uh, introduced the zombie concept as one of a lifeless automaton made to work cane fields. The cannibal connection here uh, begins to fade. Depression-era America 
resonates with the trope, which may be why it entered Hollywood in 32, becoming familiar by the 40s. The exoticness of the trope allowed blackness to loom and become a backdrop in these early films, rather than a direct, threatening presence. There's also a haunting of victimized white femininity, and miscegenation was an implicit and sometimes explicit topic in many of these works. So here's uh, The Magic Island on the left, and then a movie that uh, basically takes, it lifts the trope and makes it into cinematic uh, material, uh, White Zombie, where Bela Lugosi plays a kind of off-white zombie master who is some sort of connection to the natives, um, learns some of their black magic and teaches it uh, to other people, but then also uses it for his own financial gain. Um, there's a man who like wants a woman who's set to be married to someone else, and this man makes Bela Lugosi zombify her. So that's where we get the idea of the white zombified victim. It's in the very first movie. Of course, this white feminine victim uh, can be saved by the uh, cis hetero white male at the end. So he's, he, she can uh, come back to white civil society through his love, basically, which is kind of interesting, as opposed to Bela Lugosi's queer, off-white desire. Um, and so this is Candace's point about reproduction, right? As opposed to penetrative reproduction, we get reproduction through biting, zombification of, uh, you know, like, there's the voodoo master curse, black magic curse, and other, other means of, like, queer reproduction. So yeah, the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century zombie trope in the US uh, required the deracialization of zombie, which are, uh, zombie is an ethnically indigenous Haitian concept, and reoriented to fit the white American concerns of the loss of the slave labor force, interracial reproduction, religion, the Great Depression, et cetera, the issues of the 30s um, in the US. The zombie status as folklore also meant that it was public domain, so crucially, Hollywood outfits didn't need to pay royalties to anybody. It also merged with previous understandings of nature and science run amok, as well as fears of decolonial revolt, depicted respectively, as Candace expertly described in uh, Shelley's Frankenstein, as well as Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. As the zombie lost its colonially developed connection to Haiti in the 40s and 50s, it became ever present in Western media. A crucial theme from the beginning is the white male savior, Sarah Loro also problematizes George Romero's positioning as some sort of break with the early zombie uh, cinema and lit. And this is generally argued on the grounds of the kind of black messiah in the Romero trilogy, who, as Candace mentioned, was killed by the end of the movie, of the first one, uh, Night of the Living Dead. But all the tropes in this film were actually present in, in previous movies. For example, Horror of Party Beach, 1964, which also has the white feminine victim, cis white male uh, hero, et cetera. So if that's the case, if, he's not, if Romero is not doing anything new, why does he occupy such a prevalent role? In some sense, Romero cements the science and nature run amok trope, as well as the idea of depicting the walking dead with bodily decay, and this makes sense. Uh, if sufficiently advanced tech is indistinguishable from magic, then the West would see its own scientists as voodoo priests, right? which the word is boko. So here are the soldiers of C Company, 2nd Battalion, 22nd Infantry, 10th Mountain Division, securing Port-au-Prince Airport on the first day of Operation Uphold Democracy, the uh, beginning of the Haitian occupation in 1915 by the US. So, uh, right, we've got this occupation in Haiti, we've got the encounter with, like, on the ground, indigenous concepts, and we've got um, sensationalized versions, like W.G. Seabrook, uh, then we've got movies that are uh, kind of build upon Seabrook and start to deracialize the trope. Uh, and that's the 30s. Whereas in the 40s and 50s, we see a, a shift away from the Caribbean and uh, mind control or soul control um, to the idea of space, the nuclear, the militarized zombie, etc. So the concept of a local zombie master is still there. We've got the priest or the unscrupulous clients of a priest or a mad scientist, but there's still a, a shift happening and the outside or non-American nature of the trope meant that it had no conventions in the US and was thus very flexible. Zombies could be undead, drugged, mind-controlled, soul-possessed, alien-abducted, irradiated, etc. However, uh, Chara Desiree Key argues that Night of the Living Dead was in fact a break in tradition, a return to the cannibal trope without the voodoo implications of a master. 
So the colonial cannibal trope is actually a way of de-racializing the zombie uh, and de-Haitianizing it. The film, Night of the Living Dead, also cements the eviscerated or gory depiction of zombies, whereas the earlier works in the genre uh, didn't show zombification's effects on the body. So there was a kind of uncanny valley, right? The white feminine victim just looked like a normal person. There wasn't any evisceration or gore. Um, it was more of a mental control happening by a local master. Um, the mind or self was the victim, but in the modern zombie, the body appears soulless, so there's no soul to control. Rather, there's just this uh, cannibalistic automated impulse, right? Uh, brainless desire to consume flesh. Uh, destabilized as a measure of self and other, the zombie opens up to tropes of infection or contagion after Romero. Here's the uh, sugar mill zine from the first zombie Sugar Mill scene from the first zombie movie, White Zombie. Um, here, Bela Lugosi's zombie slaves are working a sugar mill plantation. It's refining sugar cane to sell to the uh, French and English. Um, right after this still, uh, one of the zombies who is black falls into the sugar mill uh, and you know is eviscerated, but there's no um, this is a cinematic non-event. It doesn't register as an event at all. So it's, it's kind of a notable, it's the first time we see on screen a black zombie. And uh, th that first time is a, a moment of evisceration that is a cinematic non-event. Uh, Gretchen Baca says that the measure of humanity in a film is the ability to carry narrative weight. And so here where there's no narrative weight, we can obviously see the dehumanization being depicted. Secularization um, also seems to play a role in this deracialization and the shift regarding the zombie trope. Uh, the final result, the human-like automaton with an autonom autonomous, all-consuming drive to consume human flesh, seems to have shed its religious origins, but only by means of a return of the originary cannibal trope of Catholic colonial encounter. So again, this kind of use of a colonial religious trope to de, -de to secularize and de-Africanize the zombie itself. Um, the endogenous Haitian examples of zombie astoir, or zol zombie, and zombie cocadav, or body zombie, that W.G. Seabrook wrote about, emerge from the syncretized struggle of various detribalized, enslaved, exploited, maimed African and Amer indigenous peoples who somehow managed to escape or navigate through political tools that I've already discussed, like Manieles and Cofradias, but also like ones that aren't as revolutionary, like there were absolutely maroon colonies that had deals with like, for example, the English in Guyana, who worked as jungle police to capture escaped slaves and Amer indigenous people. So we gotta make sure that we keep that in the context as well. And then not everything was revolutionary. Um, it was more just about the vicissitudes of surviving attempted wholesale genocide. So, you know, some attempts at surviving were woke as fuck and some were not. Um, the infection or contagion aspect of the modern zombie trope is also a secularization of the fear of incursion of African spiritualities of the Caribbean, especially in the wake of the Haitian Revolution. So again, this fear of like, we're gonna be next. So yeah, now I turn to the literary modernist uh, Caribbean uh, response to the zombie, uh, but I wanted to kind of summarize the timeline so far. So, you know, I've thrown a lot of information at you, but 1440, Portugal settles in West and Central Africa, develops fetish, capricious belief in the agency of objects. 1490s, Spain settles in uh, the Canary Islands and Haiti, develops the cannibal and carib trope. Um, we get resistance from both mainland Africans and Aphrodite works from 1500s to, well, till today, but till 1780s, till the beginning of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, so we get religious syncretism, um, the fear of a black republic, colonizers fear this savage cannibal religion of Wodun. Uh, in Brazil, again, figures like Ganga Zumba and Sumidos Palmares strike fear in Western hearts. Then 1790 to 1804, the Haitian Revolution proper. Uh, 1805 to 1910s, we've got the travel writers, demagogues, and others titillating Europeans and American mainlanders with tales of this cannibalistic Vodun religion body and mind possession, et cetera. There are very few direct reports, mostly hearsay, but Vodun is deeply linked with cannibalism and slave revolts in the West. Then uh, more contemporary, we get the US occupation in 1915 to 34, direct encounter with endogenous Haitian concepts, zombie astual, 
or soul zombie and zombie kokadav or body zombie. Um, and these concepts likely result from syncretization due to enslavement. Um, so they're likely colonial or post-colonial rather than ancestral or original. Um, they result from the colonial encounter and have to do with the dialogue between these two powers. Um, so Seabrook and others misunderstand these endogenous concepts. And then the zombie enters US culture in 1929 with Seabrook and 32 with Halpert. So that's kind of where we are so far. I want to turn to Sarah Loro, who uh, is uh, one of the kind of foundational scholars of the zombie, um, Sarah Juliet Loro. She kind of lays out a timeline of the imperial development of the zombie tropes since 1915 and says that there are three phases. Uh, the first is cultural aggression, or again, what Herman calls the Haitian Gothic. Uh, so the first films of the Caribbean, the first films about the zombie demonize the Caribbean as a backward and superstitious culture. And this is in line with a much longer history, like fetish and, and cannibal and stuff. Uh, after cultural aggression, we get erasure. So this is mid-century, post-war. Uh, the Caribbean and its complex history drops out of the cinematic zombie narrative, and we get the uh, mad scientist, um, the comet or meteoroid that's infecting people, the virus as in Romero, and then we get a reinscription where in film critics and audiences claim that the zombie is their own invention. It's an American monster and therefore wholly different from the Haitian uh, original, basically. So uh, Loro kind of details these three phases and argues that nevertheless, the potential for resistance is inherent to the zombie and this repressed or erased potential is always accessible. And I, I talk about some of these movements that um, enchant consumption, as I call it. They draw upon the ritual consumption that has been demonized and uh, presents a kind of iterative, modernist, literary aesthetic that has been foundational to the Caribbean. Uh, Haiti recycles the Western zombie myths, specifically the cannibal, to engage the way that the past always haunts the present. Uh, how the past is unfinished, forever refashioned to new ends. The zombie is about eternal return of both slavery and revolt. Sarah Loro speculates that if the etymology of zombie, the endogenous Haitian concepts of zombie, uh, relate to soul capture for the purpose of enslavement, then Haitian critical perspectives against this, uh, so for example, uh, critiques of the failure of revolution, of US debt by governance, banana republics, so-called, critiques of establishment of industrial plantations and eventual occupation, et cetera. Um, all of these kind of serve as a basis for, unfortunately, the state appropriation of Vaudun, such as with the Duvalier regime for violent ends. Uh, so Papa Doc, uh, Duvalier, was actually a fundamental thinker of what's called Andijen, a Haitian response to US occupation, which valorizes African and Amer indigenous uh, concepts and aesthetics in Haiti but he kind of built up this mass following in order to end up becoming a US-sponsored dictator. So it's kind of interesting to think through uh, some of that connection. Um, the way that taking back the trope from the slave master can lead to certain people kind of occupying the slave master's role, as, as Candace mentioned in her talk. Uh, analysis of Haitian reappropriations of this metamyth uh, rests on speculation, but whether metamyth or not, the textual body of the zombie, as Loro calls it, is used in Haitian literature at least back to the 19th century and absolutely indicates an engagement with colonial and post-colonial circulation and reappropriation. And this kind of writing or aesthetic style is a process-based, abstract, iterating, compositional technique that includes elements from folklore, the specter of slavery's return in new tech, and the eternal possibility of revolution in response to the latter specter. And the possibility of revolution in the zombie narrative is understood as a feeding the zombie salt. And that's what wakes the zombie up. So being salty is what makes you woke. <laughs> uh, more broadly, the notion of full reclamation, uh, Loro's concept of full reclamation is correct, since the zombie, the indigenous Haitian concept itself, denotes a specific set of Haitian perspectives on enslavement, syncretism, Catholicism, industrialization, et cetera, rather than some sort of specific fixed theological, ontological, original concept. There's a plurality of interpretations here in the unclear etymology, which is quite productive, uh, and echoes perhaps the original European fears of cannibal, uh, Amerindigenous, and African hordes, as well as later militias of 
rebel slaves and maroons under the call of Bodun. This also reflects the uh, past and present of the zombie's oral status, and the passage of time contributes to this lack of clarity or plurality of meanings. Contemporary Haitian refiguration of the zombie corresponds to what Fanon calls a literature of combat, waging battle in symbolic and mythic space. The fearsome zombie hordes, all-consuming flesh lust, is part of the Haitian arsenal of popular self-imagining, weaponizing the trope and its fearsomeness. Uh, in the wake of Haitian state appropriations like the Duvaliers, the Haitian public was further motivated to reclaim Vaudun for the people. The two phases of salting and then radicalizing the zombies into a revolutionary army correspond, in Laura's analysis, and I agree, to the two phases of the zombie trope as reappropriated in Haitian literature. Here are some of her books, Kill the Overseer, Transatlantic Zombie, and the anthology Zombie Theory. These are all good books. So yeah, what are some of these resistant literary formations that reappropriate the zombie and the cannibal? Um, first is uh, La Real Maravijou, or Marvelous Realism. It starts in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, it became magical realism or whatever, but it's really a Haitian Creole concept that starts before, long before Marquez. <laughs> Um, so we've got Ignace No, the Arduin brothers, Oswald Duran, etc., arguing for um, a valorization of Haitian folk concepts as an authentic depiction of the real. Uh, and then we've got um, literary cannibalism, basically. We've got Brazilian anthropophagismo in the early 20th century, so Oswald de Andrade, Mario de Andrade, etc., uh, Suzanne Cesser, Martinique, she uh, had a literary cannibalism. She's the ex-wife of Aimé Césaire, one of the architects of Negritude, along with uh, Leopold Senghor, Jeanne and Paulette Nadal, etc. Um, we've got Haitian Andigène, which is a direct response to U.S. occupation and a valorization of Afro-Indigenous Haitian culture. Uh, we've got Wilson Harris's quantum fiction. Uh, Wilson Harris was building on the Carib bone flute, which was a ritual consumption of a morsel of flesh of an enemy of war. Um, a desiccation or evisceration of the body and uh, rendering the forearm bone, or what is this, the femur, whatever, forearm bone into a flute, drilling holes into it, and instead of playing it, uh, bringing it up to your mouth and pretending to play it. So generating a kind of silent cannibal music. And uh, Harris's fiction is heavily building on this idea of the carob bone flute and this cannibal ritual. And then uh, most contemporary, uh, Haitian spiralism, post-war movement developed by Franck Etienne, René Philotet, and Jean-Claude Fignolet. Suzanne Césaire said, uh, la poésie Martinique sera cannibale ou ne sera pas. Martinique poetry will be cannibal or it will not be at all. Caliban said in Shakespeare's Tempest, you taught me language and my profit on it is, I know how to curse. The Red Plague rigged you for learning me your language. I'll learn you. So the trope is first you, the zombie trope is first uh, reappropriated in revelatory ways, beginning with Ignace Now's historical fiction. So Now, the Arduins, etc., work to reveal uh, oppression to the people, the masses, in the disappointing wake of the Haitian Revolution. In the second phase, the trope could be weaponized by these masses. Uh, unlike most other Creole and light skinned elites who avoided uh, rural superstitions, Ignace Now promoted Le Mario Creole ancestor to what we would now call uh, Caribbean magical realism, Alejo Carpentier's Los uh, Real Maravilloso, Afro-Caribbean mythopoeticism, etc. Uh, syncretizing historical realism and folkloric mystical elements uh, was a way of valorizing the latter in relation to the former. It also brought to bear the iterative, metatextual, consumptive elements that became key in, for example, Suzanne Césaire's cannibal Martinican literature and postmodern movements like spiralism. Uh, the first novel written in Creole was Frank Etienne's Desafi from 1972. It's an example of his process of iteratively rewriting his texts and imagines the revolutionary salted zombie as the basis of literary composition. The evisceration of past iterations is mirrored in the revolting zombie's evisceration uh, in the novel of the enslaving zombie master or uh, you know, voodoo priest Santil, whom critics often interpret as a stand-in for Papa Doc Duvalier. So here's uh, Ignace Now's books. Um, Le Lambi is nice. There's a collected uh, edition of his poetry as well. So uh, 
with the, uh, his brother Emil and the three Arduin brothers, Ignaz Noh started the Poetic School of 1836. Here's Osvald Durand, uh, wrote in the generation after now and extolled the virtues of revolutionary slave ancestors, the beauty of Haitian island culture, and the legitimacy in a literary sense of oral folk narrative. Here are some Brazilian examples of anthropophagismo. On the, we, on the left, we've got um, Osvaldo de Andrade's Manifesto Antropófago, the uh, anthropophagist manifesto. And then on the right, uh, Mario de Andrade, his cousin's uh, first novel, Macunaima, which is about a uh, Carib cannibal. Here are the originators of spiralism. We've got Jean-Claude Fignolet, René Philoctet, and Juan Catillon. Juan Catillon is important, so I also have some of his books here. Uh, to emphasize this kind of iterative rewriting process, we see his original uh, Creole version, Desafi, but then the uh, also French rewriting that he does called Les Affes d'un Défi. Uh, so even in the kind of translation process, he's thinking through uh, this cannibalist rejection of the origin uh, in favor of a kind of iterative rewriting process that uh, finds a whole projected from a fragment, perhaps the inherited fragment of our diasporic cultures. Language is the means not only of zombification, but of liberation from it. In an interview with Sukunawa Kunio, Frank Etienne says, uh, perhaps echoing you know, the biblical genesis, give me one single word and I will recreate the universe. Spiralism is a Haitian avant-garde aesthetic initiated by Philoctet, Finolet, and Frank Etienne. The spiral, like that seen in the conch shell, is a finite natural form which projects infinity. This rhymes with language, for example, Creole itself, and all Creoles, which are the completed languages emerging from the minds of children who are taught pigeons. Pigeons are a simplified means of communication. Grant me this detour because I studied linguistics, so it's like very interesting to me. Um, pigeons are a simplified means of communication between two populations who don't know each other's languages. Uh, children born in the contact zone complete the pigeon, unconsciously uh, turning it into a full language, so adding all the parts that are missing due to the nature of the mind. It's a wonderful and incredible thing. Uh, all languages work this way, but they work that way in a longer time scale. The thing that's incredible about Creoles is that this happens in one or two generations, so it's accelerated. Um, Creoles are you know, complete languages with complete syntax, morphology, phonology, semantics, etc. And all of that is lacking in the pigeon, so it's, it's just amazing that something about the way the mind is lets these kids fill it out and then their kids learn a full language. Um, spiralism draws on this iterative format, seeing in the fragments the projection of holes, which slip through dualisms and binaries in a productive way. Funk at the end engages an aphrodisiac aesthetic of deterministic chaos in this iterative approach of finding the hole in the fragment, the power of natural materials, um, dirt, skulls, blood, echoed, is echoed in the power of language, Language is transformative and its source may be from an immaterial or even informatic realm, requiring constant retracing of one's steps, inconvenient meta-type thought processes, uh, analysis paralysis as it's called, uh, shifting of one's position, and constant milestones of ego death as category boundaries dissolve in the search for the unmediated, or with reference to the salted zombie, the salt perhaps. A phrase or text is always its own double, projecting the whole from within the fragment, perhaps the way the seed contains the plant. Asselin Shahal uh, states that the spiralist text reproduces formally the profusion that is the essence of reality by means of stylistic effects based on polyphony and polyrhythm, as well as on clashes and harmony, on opposition and fusion. And in an interview with Ulrich Fleischmann, Franck at the end states the spiral by its unfolding movements, its to and fro movements, its palpitation in every direction represents life's movement. Moreover, it moves forward. It is a progression forward and upward spiral. But it can also be a drilling down in the other direction, which is interesting as I think about my own mental health spirals. Right? At the beginning of Ready to Burst, uh, Fuan Cathien breaks the fourth wall to offer a definition of spiralism. He says, spiralism defines life at the level of relations, colors, odors, sounds, signs, words, and historical connections. Recreating holes from mere details and secondary materials, the practice of spiralism reconciles art and life through literature and necessarily breaks with the hypocrisy of the word. 
Spiralism uses the complete genre in which novelistic description, poetic breath, theatrical effect, narratives, stories, autobiographical sketches, and fiction all, exist harmoni all coexist harmoniously. So we see that this spiralist project is omnivorous or cannibalistic. As well, we see, uh, well, this is about the course itself. In week five of my zombie course, we directly engaged Fuang Getien and Kayama Glover, one of his uh, central scholars. She's brilliant. Uh, we can see how this is the same tactic, this, uh, this mongrelism uh, is the same tactic at a larger scope uh, from the phrase or fragments of the macro of the full work. And uh, Rachel Douglas's book, Fuang Getien, and rewriting is a great in-depth analysis of Frank Etienne's actual writing process and the way that he uses his older writing as a kind of source for consumption and uh, sublimation. If the zombie trope is a figure of becoming, then the constant becomingness of the iterating spiralist phrase or text resonates with the consuming drive and liminal or flux state. The iterative search for salt takes on spiral shapes, always recirculating, but rising or falling or growing or shrinking, changing, becoming. Uh, now I turn to this idea of literary cannibalism, especially in the work of Suzanne Cesaire. One of her best uh, scholars is Valérie Loichot. So she's a scholar of this kind of kitchen poetics or poetics of uh, ritual consumption. And here are some of her books. The uh, material that I'm drawing on here is from The Tropics, Bite Back, Culinary Coups, and Cannibal Liter in Caribbean Literature. So yeah, she ties together Oswaldi Andrade, Suzanne Cesaire, and Marie Condé, a Martinican writer. Uh, she wrote a book called Story of Cannibal Woman, as well as many other great novels. Um, so Loichot's analysis of literary cannibalism sees it as a resistance against literary colonialism. There's a critical ingestion of the European texts in people like Andraji, Cesare, Conde, and reveals these texts not to be canonical or original or ontologically pure, but themselves pale, corrupt, mongrel copies. While the gesture relies on European notions of authorship, to subsequently turn them on their head. Literary cannibalism also indicates the inherently consumptive or digestive nature of text and language. I may say there's a simulative model of consumption, so again, one of the architects of negritude, is in contrast with his ex-wife, Suzanne Césaire's destructive model. She says, assimilation implies the conservation and the adoption of the form of the consumed object and the dissolving of the eater self. Cannibalism implies the violent destruction of the eaten object by the eater. Due to misogynoir, of course, Suzanne Cesaire's work has been uh, woefully underanalyzed in the shadow of the male kind of negritude giants like Cesaire, Senghor, etc. Literary cannibalism is a resistance strategy for Suzanne Cesaire in response specifically to surrealist Andy Breton's attempt to consume her as the exotic muse. So Suzanne Cesaire has a very short literary career. She wrote seven essays, but these seven essays are like foundational. And collected in a great anthology called The, the Great Camouflage. Uh, and in two of these essays uh, from 1941, um, she kind of responds to Breton's uh, dehumanizing and misogynist fetishization of her mixedness. He describes her as a, a flower, an extension of the landscape, um, a hymen that he, he, he must break, uh, you know, picking a flower, etc. So in four of these essays, um, from 41 to 45, all of which deal with aesthetics and politics, Césaire evokes Breton, who for her is a tourist who looks but does not see, produces sugar and vanilla fluff. And uh, Loichot reads her essay, the kind of famous Suzanne Césaire essay, in praise of Breton, as deeply ironic and critical of him. He uh, wrote these racist uh, pieces that she cites and quotes in order to build uh, a kind of essay-length subtweet of, Cesa of uh, Breton. So for example, the sugar and vanilla bit is taken from his own description of her. And the part about Breton being a pure breed poet is her uh, cannibalizing his own racist description of Aimé Césaire, her ex-husband. Uh, the metaphorical or immaterial nature of Suzanne Césaire's literary cannibalism is contrasted with the material violence of metissage and miscegenation. So colonizers abusing and raping African and Amur indigenous women, refusing to recognize their offspring but Loichot analyzes the passage from Césaire, astutely noting that the Martinique and French original um, translated as traditionally screaming for the father uh, also means create the father. Um, 
So here, the waste product of colonization is rendered a creative agent. And in this new position uh, of creative agency, uh, Suzanne Césaire's final essay imagines l'emplant, human plant, nourished by a receptive approach to the world, a kind of photosynthetic process of consumption. So is this a shift away from the unsalted cannibal, unsalted zombie? That's kind of my question. Thank you. This is a still from the Haitian Living and Dead Ensemble's wonderful movie called Uber Tours from 2021, which uh, depicts the collective's translation of Glissant's play Monsieur Toussaint from Martinique and French to Haitian Creole. In the process of their translation and uh, rehearsal, the collective becomes uh, infected by a sickness, a spiritual sickness which can only be healed, according to the Vaudun priest, by a collective um, remedy. So everyone's got to take this remedy in order for the sickness to, to leave. And then the movie kind of depicts the power struggle among the collective of individualists versus collectivists. Should we take this, should we not? Uh, so yeah, we're going to have a little break and then show my film, which talks about Dominican uh, cultural, religious, musical worker, Enrolisa Nunez, uh, who works in um, Salve Criolla, or Creole, Creole Salve, uh, Afro-Dominican musical expression. Uh, and then we also talk about uh, the appropriation of her work by the mixed Dominican, Quinito Mendes, and her response to that. So thanks. Oh wait, I'll take some questions too, sorry. <laughs> I don't normally do this, but for Candace. Okay, thanks. If you have a question, raise your hand so I can bring you the mic, please. Thank you. <laughs> I have one question, I have one question. Yes, yes, Candace. Um, it's a really general one. But I, w I was hoping for the, that you could just describe a little bit more um, spiralism and uh, what is my handwriting say? Oh, uh, I think something you said is the literary aesthetic of the Caribbean and CLR James. Hmm. Yeah, so the zombie class uh, centers on three books that we read over 11 weeks. Um, first is The Black Jacobins by CLR James which is basically a biography of Toussaint Louverture, um, the first hero of the Haitian Revolution, who, as I said, was Frenchified and believed in French uh, ideals of liberté, égalité, fraternité. Um, Napoleon lures him to a jail in the Jura Mountains in France, and he dies there. Uh, but Dessalines takes up the Haitian Revolution uh, and finishes that project, basically. Um, and the understanding is that Dessalines is not as Frenchified um, he doesn't care about French Enlightenment ideals. He's trained by a woman who is part of the royal lineage of Dahomey and is, is very like, one of his sayings is, leave nothing white behind you. So Dessalines was very much scorched earth. Uh, fair enough, I mean, Napoleon sent Rochambeau and Leclerc in 1802 uh, as the final kind of uh, dispatch to Haiti and told Rochambeau and Leclerc kill everybody. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Napoleon is trying to go to Russia. He's like, kill everybody on that fucking island and we're done. So uh, yeah, the, the Haitian and Dominican like resistance kind of begins in that context of, of Dessalines dealing with uh, Toussaint's inability to reach the Haitian masses because he was so Frenchified. Um, and so class is basically a big question in how people are valorizing or demonizing the aesthetics of the masses, um, Vodun and 21 divisions. Um, unfortunately, like I said in the lecture, there, there had been a kind of reappropriation of the aesthetic of the masses by people like Duvalier and Trujillo and DR, who were trained by US Marines and kind of drew upon the um, Vodun aesthetics to uh, present themselves as, as legitimate, you know? Um, then for the other question about spiralism, I understand spiralism as like, if I, if I go back to the slide about, this is way far back, sorry, but the Congo uh, cosmogram, I, I understand spiralism as a kind of 3D version of that cosmogram. So this, this counterclockwise motion, uh, sorry, yeah, here we go. This counterclockwise motion between um, 
the world of material and the world of the spirit uh, is depicted here in two dimensions. But if you read like any kind of Bantu cosmology 101, it's pretty clear that this aesthetic or motion is three dimensional. It's, well, it's many dimensions, it's pluridimensional, but since we live in three or four dimensions, let's, let's talk about those. Um, this motion can become a spiral when it goes up or down, right? And so spiralism has to do with, uh, it's, it's building on negritude basically. So negritude argued that there is a specific perception of formal qualities of African antiquity, like shape, scale, color, form. These are not, as Picasso said, distortions um, or you know, depictions of African distorted features. They're actually polyrhythmic depictions of qualities of theology, qualities of spiritual access to these realms that are divided by a, basically a horizon line or um, what's called Kalunga, which is basically the ocean, right? Kalunga is a snake that separates the uh, material and immaterial world and her qualities are water, uh, Mami Wata, Kalunga, these are similar. And so I see spiralism as, yeah, th th kind of three-dimensional depiction of this kind of theology, um, but also from, uh, with inclusion of uh, influence from Dahomey, from Fonebe cultures and Catholic cultures and stuff. And so in this kind of three-dimensional uh, projection out of the formal plastic qualities of African statuary, so people like Senghor said that uh, black folks are like, tuned into these formal qualities. We see them not as distortions, but as like true depictions, like bridgings of art and life. And so spiralism is a way of bringing that into the contemporary post-war context uh, and arguing that there is a, a specific kind of perception, almost like putting the shell up to your ear and hearing the ocean, right? So there's a, a fragment that we inherit uh, and we don't understand, which is uh, antiquity, African antiquity, European antiquity. And we have to go through a process of um, perception or interpretation um, that deals with you know, our own daily life, our own kind of, we're, we're sublimated beings that are living within this uh, life process that we have to contribute to capitalism and anti-blackness and misogyny war to live. Um, but at the same time, there's a revolutionary potential within our perception that ties into seeing the whole projected from the fragment, even if it's a spiral, like in a mental health sense, it's a spiral. Uh, but it's also a nonlinear philosophy of time that can be found, like if I pick up like a fragment and find a hole projected from it, that is me kind of tapping into that uh, percep perceptual potential. So I love that you link spiraling and spiralism, especially because of that kind of praxis of turning material and conceptual and really feeling material and conceptual as like a cipher. Or something you can touch. Something you can touch or something that also impacts your nervous system and your, your physicality. Right, because you mentioned the um, IMS. Yeah. <laughs> behaviorism and shit. I was yeah. like, oh my god, yeah. It's, it, I mean, that's, it's so strange that they like, were theorizing about that stuff too. Like, I mean, it's, it's all, it's all post-war epistems. The craziest thing, I, I didn't ask this, but they were saying that, like Freud said, as a shift away from behaviorism, that female psychology is the dark continent yep. of psychoanalysis. Yep. It's like, it's wild. This stuff is in there. You and can then literally started just read writing it. about dead people. Like right. started doing case studies of like famous dead men, like Da Vinci. It was mm -hmm. like basically like, well, can't do the, the Clark lectures. The last Clark lecture is like where he's basically like, study the feminine mind. Well, no, not for us. Like that can't be done basically. And then they start studying dead white men. Right. And, and it's stripping out their neural and, yeah, nervous systems. Nervous okay. systems. Yeah. And, and, um, Jarring them. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Putting them in jars, the preserving parts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have another question about creolization and okay. kind of like the creation of managerial class and uh, both epistem and discursive kind of conceptual space um, and material space. Kind of just curious what you think about that. Um, can you elaborate? Just like so it's pretty general. <laughs> uh, okay, oh, me and Rhea actually were in Ghana um, recently and we were uh, visiting Elmira, the slave castle there. And oh, around, surrounding the castle, there's like um, a physical space, right? Where like women who were impregnated by colonial officers, African women who were impregnated by colonial officers had um, uh, for, temp for the time and duration that they were pregnant and breastfeeding spaces that they could live, rear, 
and then were returned to camps, but then that, that those children essentially stayed. I think it was in, like interesting thinking about pigeon mm -hmm. and um, language for me, uh, and the power gaps of vacuums are something that creolization or col and colorism sort of like join to create. Um, both in that they like inherently translate then master servant class dynamics and like also carry the capacity to like you know investigate and interrogate both um, in certain contexts like in the Dessaline and Overture context though the appropriation is almost like you know leans towards the material world of the white supremacist culture primarily uh, and I think historically we have like that same kind of like lineage or whatever where creolization sort of acts as a, almost like an like um, an epistemic managerial shield or layer uh, mm -hmm. in black studies and mm -hmm. like um, so yeah I'm just kind of curious maybe yeah I, I think when you mentioned this I think of two books uh, first is called converging on cannibals if my internet works I'll tell you the author by Jared Stoller so well, I'll talk about this more in the Cassandra class but uh, Converging on Cannibals um, by Jared Stoller talks about the Portuguese mainland empires. Because, um, you know, Spain never really had access to the African interior. Spain had some coastal empires, but really Portugal was the one that supplied slaves to Spain. Um, and so this book talks about that specific Catholic, Portuguese, and Dutch encounter with Central African and West African Bantu people and how the concept of fetisho and cannibal uh, emerges as a kind of reaction to, I think European colonizers expected people to act like European serfs when they got there, and they didn't. People fought back and it pissed them off. And so in reaction to people not acting like serfs, they developed these colonial concepts like fetish and cannibal to describe, in a pejorative sense, African and Amer indigenous material and spiritual practices. So that, that's a good book to kind of deal with the cannibal which, you know, in, in the class I specifically focus on Haiti and DR, but it is a mainland concept. It doesn't start in diaspora. Um, the people that, the Portuguese, Spanish, and Dutch that go across the ocean are drawing on these mainland concepts. Um, and this book also talks, talks about cofradías founded by Congo slaves taken to Spain. So like I mentioned in the talk, cofradías started in Spain by these uh, enslaved Congo people. In Alternative History of Abstraction, as you know, I, uh, the two central books are uh, Vincent Woodard's, rest in peace, uh, Delectable Negro, and uh, J. Laurent Mattery's The Fetish Revisited. So those are two books that I would also uh, point people toward in terms of this question. Um, and then in terms of the kind of managerial aspect, um, Kaguro Macharia, he's a scholar out of Nairobi, wrote an incredible book called Fraudage where he situates diaspora as forced proximity and understands creolization as a process of relation that emerges out of this forced proximity, um, for better or worse. And so the, the management of difference, I think, is critical to understanding what a creole is, um, not only in the kind of linguistic sense of like, these are people developing a pigeon because they can't talk to each other, so they've got to do, they've got to sell and make money somehow. So they develop this limited form of communication. And then something about the mind projects a whole out of a fragment. And so I think spiralism is really interested in this cognitive um, <coughs> aspect. But uh, I, we need to start this movie, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you, Candace. Yeah. Just because it's like 5.30. So. But yeah, how does management of difference relate to managerialities? Yeah, what I was going to go to. Yeah. Like the, like the boss. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it makes sense. Delegation. Yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Manuel Arturo Abreu. I'm a Dominican poet and artist from the Bronx, currently living in Portland. 
I'm excited to think together about the wake work of Dominican musician and cultural worker Enero Lisa Nunez. Thank you to the Black Feminist Kitchen for accepting my proposal for the Black Feminist Summer School Program. And thank you to all the workers that make this event possible as well as uh, accessible presentation of the material possible. Thank you as well to the audience for tuning in. With her family band, Enero Lisa Nunez, the Queen of Salve, performs Afro-Dominican religious music in the Salve style, also called Palo or Atabales. We review some musical examples, examine the history and context of Nunez's music and Palo genres generally, and explore how Nunez navigates Afro-Dominican citizenship or no citizenship, as Christina Sharp says, in a context where Palo seems to move into national prominence since the 90s, but is in fact reduced to roots or folklore not recognized as retention of living African presence and resistance in the Dominican spiritual and social fabric. We analyze the specific exploitative context of Enero Lisa's collaboration with Dominican musician Quinito Mendez. Despite such marginalization, practitioners like Nunez continue to work in the wake to maintain the fullness of African spirituality in the face of the anti-black specter of brujeria in the Christian Dominican mainstream, the commemorative national and corporate use of folkloric music, as well as what Sharp calls oceanic time, a time that does not pass, a time in which the past and present verge. From a space under the water, debajo del agua, and that Olisa works to heal herself and retain her family's traditions. The No Citizens Music Sharp writes that the wake has positioned us as no citizen. We are black peoples in the wake with no state or nation to protect us, with no citizenship bound to be respected. To live in the wake is to live in oceanic time where nothing changes. It's the same as 1460, as 1492, as 1619. The waves of this are felt in the body in light of the farce of black citizenship. For example, formulations like Black American or Black Dominican, which work to conceal this anti-black truth, which is all pervading like the weather, as Sharp argues. There is no black citizen, despite naive and violent strivings from self-styled great men. The assimilation of black people into the state always reinscribes social death. Black people's outsized fugitive cultural production and reproduction as people in bondage and with bondage looming over us comes from doing whatever we must to survive. Such production and reproduction is simultaneously made invisible with its real properties criminalized and erased and hypervisible with its service qualities whitewashed or mestizo washed and reduced to evidence of success of the national project. Music and the arts in the context of national imagining and statecraft sit alongside the normative work of institutions like museums, memorials, etc. Sharp writes, The wake and wake work trouble the ways most museums and memorials take up trauma and memory. If museums and memorials materialize a kind of reparation or repair and enact their own pedagogies as they position visitors to have a particular experience or set of experiences about an event that is seen to be past, how does one memorialize chattel slavery and its afterlives, which are unfolding still? Here, Sharp echoes critiques of the normalizing role of commemorative space by Hortense Spillers. The concept of national memory can only serve to foreclose the possibility of true repair by erasing the ongoing nature of social death in the plantation form. Rendering the Middle Passage as past conceals its ongoing nature, another way to keep black people in oceanic time. This is the case across the Americas, such as with music, which states deploy for the marketing of national projects to no benefit and in fact to great harm against black people in their respective contexts. We can look at Cold War era US jazz diplomacy, black tango as roots of Argentina in the wake of the 19th century genocide of black Buenos Aires folks, or anti-black genocidal Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo's co-opting and mestizo washing of merengue as soundtrack for national terrorizing, maiming, and murder of Haitians, Afro-Dominicans, and Haitian heritage Dominicans. In this case, we conceive of the practice of Dominican musician and cultural worker Enero Lisa Nunez as wake work. We look at how the idea of Dominican roots music two generations after Trujillo's assassination is one such farce of black citizenship, concealing the historical and ongoing violence against Haitians, Haitian heritage Dominicans, Afro-Dominicans in general, and in particular dark-skinned women and gender non-conforming people as constitutive element of the Dominican national imaginary and statecraft. Rendering Palo as folklore erases its African religious properties to make it palatable to an anti-black Christian public still steeped in anti-black notions of brujeria and whitewashed Catholicism. However, Enerolisa's cultural work continues to resist these anti-black dehumanizing structures and national cultural formulations, stewarding the fullness of African spirituality as expressed in her hometown of San Felipe de Villamella. 
To live and work in the wake is to reject nations, which are but dealers of death. In the Dominican context, this means understanding Palo and Salve music, not as roots of Dominican national or cultural identity, but as resistance to nationalism, as a bridge or site of encounter between Dominicans and Haitians, as retention of legacies of Afro and Amer indigenous spiritual, political, and cultural resistance, to honor Palo in its full African spiritual dimension, rather than as folkloric or roots component of secular Dominican culture, is to defend all the dead who stewarded it to us and all the living who maintain these practices. And then Olisa Nunez. Nos encontramos en la vivienda de nuestra reina del salve, quien es la portadora de tradiciones de la música folclórica dominicana actual. A mi lado, nuestra reina del salve, Enerolisa Núñez. Enerolisa, ¿cuáles fueron sus inicios en la música folclórica dominicana? Mi inicio fue con una tía mía, Coba. Coba Núñez, que era hermana de mi papá, y ella iba a buscarme para llevarme a la velación. Y yo con ella aprendí a cantar. Ya a los ocho años ya yo tocaba pandero. Seguí siempre con mi mamá que también cantaba. Y después de que crecí, venían a buscarme para a cantar velación, a hacerle la fiesta, 50 pesos. Después, 100 pesos. Después que ya 200 pesos. En fin, que, y mire dónde estoy. Gracias, señor. Y de la grabación en el 92 que empecé a grabar. Vemos también en Eroliza que sus hijos también siguen sus pasos porque vemos a Osvaldo, uno de sus, eh, de sus hijos, donde él toca la guira. También vemos a Jenny, que Jenny es la que toca el pandero y por supuesto una artista tremenda. ¿Qué usted nos puede decir sobre, su, sobre ellos? No, que lo que ellos saben lo aprendí de mí y yo hice el grupo con ellos. Este grupo mío con Jenny, Osvaldo, que son los dos hijos míos, con Fulgencio, que es el sobrino, Freddy, también es sobrino, Gilly, eh, eh, que es sobrina, un grupo de familia completo. Ay, sí, los nietos me ya tocan. Yo tengo en el grupo hay dos nietas grandes, la Jenny, hija de Jenny. ¿Siguen sus pasos? Sí, esas están conmigo en el grupo. Y los pequeños están tocando solo. Ahí, yo tengo nietos que tocan güey y tambor allá también. ¿Qué tanta influencia, señora Lisa, reciben sus canciones a la hora de usted tocar a los altares? Es que lo hago con amor, con la fe y pensando que hay un Dios y que los lo santos que yo le canto me dan fuerza, me dan ánimo porque es eh, bueno eso. A mí me, a yo lo vivo. Wow. Ya después de los ocho años ya yo tocaba pandero, un panderito de los pequeños, ya yo lo tocaba. Y así fui, fui creciendo, fui conociendo, fui creciendo, fui conociendo y cantando. Entonces yo de ahí le tuve mucha fe a la salve que cantaban en los altares de los santos. Usted sabe que eso es descendencia de África. Ahí hay muchos mucho santos que yo le canto en su nombre. Papá Guedé, Guedé Limbó, Papá Bocó. Todos esos son santos negros. Hasta ahora no la están tomando mucho en cuenta, pero todavía se mantiene mucho la... Muchos la siguen y muchos no. Otros se sienten que no quieren aceptar la realidad, lo que es la cultura, lo que es la salve. Y muchos no nos están ahora apoyando, muchos no apoyan y muchos no, porque no creen como en estas cosas. Antes mi abuela se celebraba una fiesta que le, le cantaban al Espíritu Santo, el Santo Cristo, la serenata, y le hacían una, una velación a San Ramón. Y yo aprendí en este ambiente y así me he criado y he seguido con la tradición. Esto es improvisado, yo lo hago, yo no estudié eso de música, nada de eso, eso me sale a mí, de adentro, de la sangre. Dicen que es una cosa, porque le cantamos a los santos y todo eso, nada de eso tiene que ver con muchas cosas que ellos malinterpretan de otra manera. Si uno es una tradición, yo me crié en este ambiente y no, no veo que está nada mal, sino que se sigue y cada... cada cada región tiene su, su forma de desarrollarse. 
yo le solto que la salve, hay que mantenerla porque es una tradición del Espíritu Santo. And then Olisa Nunez was born on the 19th of January in 1952 in San Felipe de Villamella in the village of Mata los Indios. Uh, sorry for the unfortunate name. Since childhood, she's been singing songs her mother, grandmother, and great grandmother taught her, and also playing a pandero or hand drum that her aunt Jacoba Nunez gave her when she was eight. Since then, she says, I've had a lot of faith in salve music, which is sung at the altars of the saints. You know, this is descended from Africa. There's many entities I name and praise. Papa Gede, Gede Limbo, Papa Boko. These are all black saints. She teaches her kids the songs and rhythms she was taught, and they all play together. Before we dive in, let's listen to arguably Enerolisa's most famous recording, Los Olivos, a devotional song for Agumba Lenjo, who owns Thunder and is syncretized with St. James. and Dominican Voodoo. While all Dominican secular music genres such as bachata, merengue, dembo, mambo de calle, and others retain strong African influence, there are a few musical styles which are retentions of specifically spiritual African practices. In contemporary Dominican popular religion, there are cofradías, or uh, mutual aid societies based in the Catholic Church, whose music is palo and its various sub-styles such as palo de muerto. There are voodoo and espiritista societies whose music is non-liturgical, or Creole Salve, Salve Criolla, and their border town, Gaga or Rara religious ceremonies, which play a musical style called Tambu Petro. The 21 division centers on veneration of Loas, also called Misterio or Mysteres, Mysteries, uh, and Santos, Saints. The Loas are organized into divisions or nations, 
Their origins are from Fonewe Voduns, Yoruba Orishas, deities of various Congo and Angola region Bantu tribes, and indigenous Caribbean deities called Semis, as well as, of course, conversation and exchange with Haitian Bulu. The European component comes from forced syncretism, where African peoples address the African entities in Catholic drag in order to continue practicing in secret. So, for example, Fonewe Vodun Legba syncretized with St. Anthony of Padua, indigenous Zemi Tinjo Alawe syncretized with St. Raphael, the Archangel, and Yoruba Orisha Ogun in his Balanjo aspect is syncretized with St. James. Palawar Atavales. There's the music of Dominican Voodoo, also called 21 Divisions, uh, which is sister to Haitian Voodoo, with the most commonalities existing in the Cha Cha lineage practices of northern Haiti. In the following clip, practitioner and musician Bembecito speaks on these overlaps. Uh, people always ask me, what are the 21 divisions? What's the difference with 21 divisions, uh, Dominican voodoo and Haitian voodoo? I tell them there's no difference. There is no difference. The thing is, if we erase the border, okay, let's erase the border and let's just call the island uh, what it was in the beginning of the revolution, IT. Okay, the whole island is IT, Haiti. Okay, because the Dominican Republic was just a, 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 a state that was, you know, they, they chose to separate, whatever, or uh, have, be independent, whatever. So let's erase the border. Voodoo is on the whole island, okay? But regionally, there are differences. So everywhere you go in each region, you're going to find a variation of voodoo. Haiti is divided it, it, it basically in three sections. The north, mainly two, but the north, the south. But let's put the, set, the center also. Everybody considers or knows what is Asogwe lineage, Vodun, from Haiti. Why? The reason is because everybody, this, this, this lineage was established in the 1800s. It came before, and this is from the royal lineage of Dahomey, of Vodun, okay? And they use the Ason, as their main, uh, you know, instrument. Shown here. Okay, and it's become very uh, spread throughout the world. People, when they speak of Haitian voodoo, they're talking about Asogwe lineage. Asogwe, okay? And this is where the Kanzo comes in. This is uh, one of the initiations in the Asogwe lineage, is Kanzo. They have many grades or levels of Kanzo that you have to pass or you can pass and it's, it, it is also a temple society. It's, it's, a, it's Asogwe, you will only find in temples. People congregate and do their ceremonies in temples, not in their house. You know, it can be in their house, uh, you know, sometimes in, in the countryside, but mainly it's in temples. So Asogwe is very temple oriented, okay? So for people that are not initiated in Asogwe in the capital or, or surrounding areas, they can still practice Guru and even be uh, a hungan or a mambo, but they are called makut or makusen, uh, which means, you know, uh, makut is, is what you see behind me. It's a bag. Shown here. So it was said that they used to carry their stuff on their, in the bag, but it became a term associated for the non-initiated uh, leaders that they may have, you know, a following or even a temple, okay? But they don't have the Asogwe initiation. They are not Ungan Asogwe or Mambo Asogwe, okay? So they are called Ungan Makut or Makuse, whatever, you know, th this is what happens. Um, but what people don't know is that if you travel outside of the capital, you're going to find a lot of other lineages. Once you reach very the very top of haiti there's a lot of towns okay uh so the very north of of haiti there's a town called capaisien okay or clap so this town used to be uh i think it was the colonial uh capital and there was a point where haiti was divided in three states uh after their revolution okay so the northern state uh, was very dominant at, at the, you know during the colony. Here you're gonna find uh, a, another different uh, style of vodun, and this vodun from the north, depending on the region of the north, also or the place on the north, it's gonna be very close or even exactly 
like the Vodun or the Voodoo you, you will find in the Dominican Republic. They also use the name 21 Divisions, 21 Division. Uh, again, once you move to the border areas, too, the language becomes a mix of Spanish and, and Creole. So they, they will speak both on both sides because of the interchange. Right. The, the, the Vodun practiced from, you know, from Gonaive to the, to the rest of the north is considered Cha-Cha or Kwa-Kwa. Cha-Cha or kwa, kwa is the Maraca, right? The Maraca. Shown here. They call it that because that's the main instrument used. Ason Gwe uses the Ason. Okay? So they call it Ason Gwe lineage. You will see the similarities of Guru in the north of Haiti to the Dominican Republic, and it's the same lineage. The main lineage practiced in the, the Dominican Republic is Cha Cha or Kwa Kwa Bodun. Okay? Just like in the north. So. It's not a question of if, if this is Haitian voodoo or Dominican voodoo. It's lineage, okay? Everybody associates Asongwe uh, with Haiti because that one is exclusive in Haiti, okay? In, especially in, in the capital Port-au-Prince. But cha-cha you will find all over the island, or kwa, kwa So you will have, you know, for them, that's the normal vodun. That you know, the north they stay with their own voodoo, the south with their own, everybody did their own thing, they follow their family lineage. So that's what 21 Divisions is it's just a lineage that happens to be practiced mostly all over the Dominican Republic. In a song lineage, there's reglement or rule, you will see very little variation in everything from uh, you know, the order that they sing and salute the loi. The loi, the, the ceremony and initiation. There's no change across the board in Asongwe lineage. Now, in the other lineages of, of, of Bodun on the island, you will see a lot of variation regional. Region, a lot of regional variations everywhere. So, in the Dominican Republic, you will see a lot of variations of Bodun, of the 21 divisions. So, there's, there's a base that is followed. Yes, there is a base that is followed. But there will, will be a lot of little variations and even variations in Loa or singing order or the songs or even in the initiations. When music is involved in veneration, it is customarily played with drums, palos or various types of tambor, also some drums called congos, as well as additional small percussion like balsier drums, guira, a small stick called kata, tambourines or panderos, bells, triangles, etc. While there are rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic templates, such as ordained sequences of devotional songs, specific rhythms for specific deities, etc., performers also rely socially and religiously on an ethic of improvisation, a quickening spirit, and reading the room. The term salve is used technically to denote a cappella liturgical musical performance in the Catholic choral tradition. Let's look at some examples. Now playing is a 2013 recording of Enid Olisa and her band, performing for the Virgin of High Grace or Azili Alayla. The performance opens with a salve in a Catholic-derived style, with some of the background singers mumbling the Salve Regina prayer in the background to create a buzzing or thrumming effect. This leads into a salve criolla for the Virgin.
In 2013, and then Olisa also records the performance of a salve for San Martin de Porres, Orgue de Calfu, which is now playing in the background. Here, however, in the salve section that opens, to express the pain of the loss of San Martin, the background singers yelp, moan, cry, and howl. Finally, now playing is a rhythmically free Salve Criolla for the Holy Spirit declared by Enero Lisa as her father and the Virgin of High Grace or Asilia Laila declared as her mother. The modal, wistful melody of the opening section shifts dramatically into a minor key melody and pounding palo drums. This kind of shift is characteristic of the medley-based style that Enero Lisa sometimes adopts for studio recording sessions. Non-liturgical salve criolla, or creole salve, refers to Africanized music which draws on salve vocal stylings but also involves drums. Some rhythmic, rhythmic styles include palo corrido, such as in the eastern region, palo arriba, palo abajo, and others. 
Background vocalists respond to the lead vocalist call with melodies that range from archaic and modal to more chromatic and polyphonic lines, as well as rhythms that interlock with the drums, whose influence is heavily Bantu from the modern Congo and Angola region, as well as Fon Ewe from Benin. A large number of Dominican palo drums bear strong resemblance to Bantu and Goma drums, made of hollowed out logs with an animal skin pegged over one end, played close to the body, between the legs, or with a rope tying the drum to the player's waist. As well, the use of friction tones, called musungos, points to Congo Angolan origin. And the Rolisa's band uses friction tones on the palo drums to change the pitch of their bass notes and generate melodic bass lines in the drumming to respond to the patterns and contents of the vocal work. Palo celebrations, known as mani or fiesta de palo, can be both a religious gathering and a casual celebration. The performance of palo exists on a spectrum from semi-secular to fully sacred, often in the same space and event, and includes a wide variety of genres and customs according to region, family line, deity being venerated, etc. Unlike the Asogwe lineage of southern Haiti, where events occur in temples, functions for northern Haitian and Dominican voodoo practice can occur in domestic and vernacular spaces, not just temples. For example, we hear in the background a song called Fiesta con la División by Enrolisa's band, led by a relative. The singer sings, Vamos a una fiesta con la división. Traigan la cerveza, traigan mucho rom. So it says, we're going to make a feast for the divisions. Bring much beer, bring much rum. Come Anaís a pie, or Santa Ana. Come over here. With Belia Belcan, or Saint Michael the Archangel. Even as there's space for casual activity, the music serves a spiritual function of devotion and invocation for the Loas. Some attendees might simply observe and drink. Others might become possessed by a loa, with their body acting for a period as a messenger for the deity, known in the Dominican Republic as tumbao or montao en caballo. Tumbao means fallen. Montao en caballo means uh, ridden like a horse, mounted as if you were a horse. Uh, because caballo de eh, lomiterio is what we call those people with the gift of possession, uh, horses of the loas. As the lyrics of the song indicate, alcohol is a spiritual tool in the context of venerating the Loas, not simply a social lubricant. Unlike Asogwe lineage voodoo of Port au Prince in southern Haiti, many northern Haitian and Dominican cha-cha practices do not emphasize unchanging reglement or rules and strict initiation. Instead, there's lots of regional and genealogical variations in practice based on different histories of cofradías, uh, family histories, etc. And many cases exist of lay or uninitiated people casually invoking and venerating deities received from their families. The full history of Haiti, known as Hispaniola in the West, is a topic for another talk. It suffices to say that the Catholic Church and the crowns of Castile and Aragon spent hundreds of years reconquering and re-Christianizing the Iberian Peninsula, which had been home to the Moorish Caliphate of Al-Andalus. The 1492 conquering of Granada symbolized the final victory. The funding of Christopher Columbus's voyage was a kind of victory lap. The bull Inter Caetera, one of three bulls issued in 1493 by Pope Alexander VI, sanctioned the imperial extension of Portugal and Spain and laid out an agenda of territorial domination, the acquisition of precious metals, and the subjugation of non-Europeans. In the document, the Pope boasts of the recovery of the Kingdom of Granada from the yoke of the Saracens, or the Moors, denoting it as the final campaign that eradicated Moorish rule from Iberian Peninsula and mandating the Iberian monarchs to extend their geopolitical power and dominate non-Europeans in the name of Christendom. Resistance began early. The indigenous Taino of the island of Hispaniola killed the 39 men Columbus left behind at Fort Navidad, as he discovered on his second voyage in 1493. As early as 1495, Taino leaders like Guatewara were absconding to rural mountainous areas to flee enslavement and form the basis of maroon communities that would later mix with Africans also resisting and fleeing enslavement. 
Connections between Afro-Indigenous and Amer-Indigenous peoples may also precede colonization. Some entries on Columbus's diaries corroborate Taino descriptions of African merchants arriving and trading things for valuables like guanine, which is a gold, copper, or silver alloy, as well as gold, etc. There were arguably three waves of enslavement on the island. The first wave of people were taken from the Muslim areas of Senegal, uh, Wolof Muslim people. The second wave were taken from the Congo and Angola region, and they previously had exposure to syncretism due to Portuguese colonization of that area since the 1460s. And the third wave was taken from the Bight of Benin region down to the south of Nigeria, particularly from the Kingdom of Dahomey. Colonizer Nicolas de Obando wrote to the crown in 1503, Many fled to the mountains and avoided capture, and the black people hid among the natives and taught them bad habits, unquote. Notable examples of resistance include Anacaona, uh, Anacaona's nephew, Guarocuya or Enriquillo, who led Taino and African rebels against Spaniards from 1519 to 1533 from the Bajoruco Mountains. Um, the 1521 uprising of enslaved Wolof Muslims in the sugar estate of La Isabela, owned by Diego Columbus. 16th century Maroon leaders like Sebastián Lemba, Diego Guzmán, Diego de Campo, and Juan Baquero. The fugitive Maroon state of Le Maniel in the Neiba region in the 17th century. The Afro-Dominican supporters and contributors to the Haitian Revolution in the 18th century. Uh, and this legacy continues into the 20th century with uh, possibly the most important messianic communalist leader of the Dominican Republic, Oliborio Mateo, uh, and later Florina Soriano or Mama Tingo, a black Christian agrarian activist for rural agricultural land autonomy. The Catholic colonizers and their junior partners in the modern Dominican state murdered all of these figures, but their spirit of resistance lives on in various aspects of Dominican culture and religion. Thanks to Haiti's unification of the island in 1822, the remaining 30,000 people under the cattle ranch enslavement system in the eastern side of Hispaniola gained their freedom. Prior to this, Catholic colonizers banned African drumming on both sides of the island as early as 1758. In the wake of almost selling itself back to the Spanish crown, in 1878, the nascent Dominican nation explicitly named a prohibition against palo music, fully aware of its dangerous potential to destabilize and resist the fragile Hispanophilic state, given that it was the means of the revolution, according to Cedric Robinson. Trujillo upheld this in his era with bans on drumming in San Cristobal in 1931 and a ban on the Afro-Dominican Carabine dance in 1951, issued by the Dominican Secretary of Education. In his efforts to modernize the countryside, Trujillo constantly threatened adherence of the 21 divisions with imprisonment. Ironically, Dominican people perceived the absolute brutality of Trujillo's regime, both against our religious practices and in general, as rooted in Afro-Dominican sorcery. Like any good dictator of an African or Afro-Diasporic place, Dominicans perceived Trujillo as dipping his toes in voodoo and Afro-Dominican religious activity in order to increase his power. He was said to have in his companionship a muchachito or baca, which is a bad spirit that enables people to change shape, steal farm animals and harvests, and amass wealth. And they often had soothsayers and diviners as guests. No amount of suppression can keep African religious uh, activity and music out of the life of rural Afro-Dominican people. Even during the ban on drums, which was most strictly enforced during Trujillo's era of systematic and militarized uh, surveillance and enclosure of the rural areas, people practiced their religion with just their voices or even in silence. These religions and their corresponding musical practices survive long enough to become available for assimilation into uncritical commemorative quote-unquote roots music projects as the Dominican Republic got assimilated into the global tourist industry in the wake of Trujillo's assassination, as we see in our examination of Quinito Mendez's theft of Nunez's work. In its lineages of practice, palo music has tools to resist this flattening folklore of categorization. Christina Sharp asks that we deepen our analysis of the histories and presence of Afro-diasporic resistance and avoid what Walcott calls the big narratives of fugitivity and marinage. Just as Maroons resisted Spaniard and French colonization, they also strengthened patriarchy, brokered deals with French buccaneers, acted as slave catchers for colonizers, and engaged in anti-indigenous settler activity. The maroon position was a politically fraught one, not a simply heroic one. Rather, Sharp demands that we name and perform the still living desires for more than what we presently have by attending to what she calls an ordinary note of care. The hypervisibility of Palo, Quinito Mendez's theft. 
Long criminalized and repressed, Palo music has recently seen a surge of visibility and interest in the Dominican mainstream. And Nerolisa in particular has worked with popular musicians over the years, like La Roca Banda in 94, Sonia Silvestre, Chichi Peralta, and Quinito Mendes. In 1997, the Cultural Foundation of Bayaonda asked Enrolisa Nunez to record the first installment of a planned series of albums called Musica Raiz, or Roots Music. This album brought visibility to the cultural labor of the villages of San Felipe de Villamella, which, along with Enerolisa, is home to a centuries-old mutual aid society, or Cofradia, of Congo origin, devoted to the Holy Spirit. In 2001, UNESCO proclaimed the African syncretic music and cultural work of the mutual aid society a UNESCO masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. This designation reframed the villages of Villa Media as a site of potential value extraction for popular musicians who had no context or relation to African religious or cultural practices. These designations have carried few benefits for practitioners, either monetary or otherwise. Government promises have proven empty. School curricula still do not include teaching about Afro-Dominican culture. Blackness continues to be marginalized at all levels of Dominican society and institutions and progressively oriented neighborhood, school, or city ballets of the folkloric genre are still one of the few means through which young urban Dominicans can learn about our Afro-Dominican rural heritage. This hypervisibility via UNESCO's award designation came the same year a non-black merengue musician Quinito Mendez released A Palo Limpio in 2001, an album that presented a fusion of Dominican popular music with Salve Criolla from Enerolisa. This project is instructive to explore the exploitation inherent to the Dominican roots music concept. Luego de interpretar aquellas fusiones de salve y merengue que le hicieron popular en la década de los noventas al lado del merenguero Quinito Méndez, Enerolisa Núñez cuenta en exclusiva a Gente RD cómo fue engañada por unos pesitos pese al éxito y pegada de canciones como Ocumbalen Yo, San Antonio y Esa Mujer Abraza Mi Vida. Yo soy Económicamente Enerolisa Núñez, mujer de canto alegre y misterioso, que al compás del pandero y del congo da ritmo a una de las expresiones culturales afroantillanas más antiguas del mundo, la salve. Asegura que pese a que todas estas composiciones son de su autoría, solo recibió un pago irrisorio por grabar y nunca ha recibido un centavo por concepto de derecho de autor. Él lo sabe. Eh, estuve, estuve haciéndole coro a, a Chichi Pedalta, con todito ello. Yo, le, yo toqué, le, a los, los discos que tiene Quinito Méndez de Palo son míos. Mendez and Nunez had previously worked together with the Roca Banda group in 1994, of which Mendez uh, was a member, on the song Esa Mujer Abraza Mi Vida, or That Woman Hugs My Life, a merengue palo song now playing, which appears on Roca Banda's LP Eligidos por el Pueblo, uh, elected by the village in 1994, and later reappears on Quinito's LP A Palo Limpio in 2001. For this more recent project, Rather than work with Enerolisa Núñez to write new music, Quinito Méndez instead asked if he could mesh some of her own songs uh, with his compositions. In, tw in 2017, Gente RD interviewed Núñez, where she confirmed that even though Quinito's version of Ogumba Lenjo brought him even more fame in the country, she was underpaid and barely credited for this labor. She said, for him, it went better than me because this work was mine and he got much more money than I did. 
She was given a small one-time payment and has never received royalties. Given that Merengue and Salve have common ancestors and long histories of conversation with each other, framing their family reunion as a fusion of two somehow vastly different genres makes little sense, other than as anti-black marketing technique for Quinito Mendes. His choice of al album title implies this further. A palo limpio means direct hit, but in context it also means clean palo music, implying that palo music not fused with merengue is unclean. He draws on palo or salve as denatured, secularized, de-Africanized folklore or roots, rather than as religious activity and fullness of African heritage. He also draws on the Trujillo format of merengue as national non-black music, rather than its reality as Afro-Dominican rural music. The concept of folklore or roots music secularizes and de-Africanizes Salve. We see in a 2008 interview with Quinito from Sanaoria.com that Quinito adamantly declares that his palo-infused merengue has nothing to do with quote-unquote witchcraft. Por temas como estos, el merenguero dominicano Quinito Méndez ha cosechado éxitos y reconocimientos, pero también ha sido tildado de brujo y adivinador en muchos países donde va. Por ejemplo, en Europa, cuando yo bajé de mi tarima, que una señora se me acerca y me dice, Quinito, ¿cómo usted cobra la consulta? Y yo, ¿pero qué consulta? Yo no soy médico. Y yo, no, porque yo quiero consultarme con Anaís. Y yo, no, es que no, yo creo en Dios sobre todas las cosas del mundo. Y esa es mi guía. Es eh, lo único que yo le canto a esa música cultural dominicana. A pesar de sus declaraciones, insistimos en preguntarle que si en el pasado había estado involucrado en asuntos mágicos religiosos. ¿Tú sabes que eso se usa mucho, mucho aquí en la República Dominicana. Y eh, yo recuerdo mi pueblo, eh, tanto jovencito, se usaba eso de las cartas. Pero ya que uno tiene experiencia y que uno ha madurado, tú ves eso como personas que son sabias, que lo que hacen es sacarle de dinero a, a, al otro. Pero no tiene nada que ver con mi creencia, es en Dios. Solamente canto esa música porque amo mi cultura, amo la música dominicana. Y eso tiene que ver con la República Dominicana. A pesar de su negativa, habrá tenido algo que ver con el exitazo de este artista, los asuntos mágicos. Esa música sí me ha traído premiaciones. Con la única música que he ganado el merengue del año en el Casandra fue con el suero de amor, que era una música de Atabale. Fuimos al Grammy por primera vez con esa música de Atabale. Entonces yo no puedo dejarlo porque la gente me lo pide. Pero como yo soy un vale yo. Y vengo de los olivos. Esa mujer es cantando allá arriba y eso es hasta vale. Entonces la gente cree como que tiene que... Y no, no, no tiene nada que ver con brujería. La etiqueta de brujo, no que no. Las personas que se me acercan son latinas que viven allá. Entonces creen que uno como que practica eh, eso de brujería, de Anaísa, con la música cultural y soy amante a Dios. No me pidan más nunca. Eso de que consulta, de que yo quiero chequearme con Quirito, no tiene nada que ver con él. He says, I believe in God above all, that's my guide. It's just that I sing cultural Dominican music like Palo. I remember in my village when I was young, people used that stuff, the 21 divisions. But now that one has experience and maturity, you just see that it's a bunch of wise asses taking money from people. But it has nothing to do with my faith, which is in God. I only sing that music, Palo music because I love my culture, I love Dominican music, and palo music has to do with Dominican Republic. His argument comes from European Christian closed theology, which does not allow for Afro or Amur indigenous spiritual activity to validly coexist or predominate. He sees palo music and religion simply as a component of Dominican culture and music, and believes that faith in the Christian God is mutually exclusive with faith in the 21 divisions, the Loas. He does not name Enero Lisa Núñez in the clip at all. In fact, he sings one of her songs as though it's his own, and immediately after, strips it entirely of its religious significance, echoing Spaniard paternalism by linking African spirituality with childlike things. 1 Corinthians 13.11 Finally, Quinito Mendez reduces palo music and culture and its performance to a patriotic and nostalgic endeavor, stuck or frozen in oceanic time. In reality, many of the practitioners of the 21 divisions also consider themselves to be simultaneously Catholic. Mendez's theft and denaturing of Nunez is part of a mixed-race, anti-Black Caribbean legacy of, quote, uneasy domestication of African cultural practices into inclusive idioms of national culture sanitized as folklore, legitimated by ideologies of mestizaje, unquote. In Santo Domingo, promoter Jordan Marmol has collected international funding to produce recordings 
by using traditional genres and arranged pieces played by traditional musicians, promoted together with revivalists to bring together urban and rural styles. His efforts have allowed Enerolisa Nunez to see some funds. However, Martha Ellen Davis argues that the microfame of select musicians and ensembles has ossified their spontaneity into performances of pieces and arrangements as recorded, showing how technological reproduction of black cultural activity also does the oppressive work of oceanic time. The solution to the exploitation and theft of someone like Quinito Mendez against Enerolisa Nunez is definitely not the stultification of her improvisational creativity, which is at the root of her Sarbi Criolla music. Debajo del agua, Tinjo Alagüe and Oceanic Time. Despite Quinito Mendez's attempt to steal Enerolisa's music for his own gain and erase the spiritual component of her cultural work, average people hold her in high esteem. Here's a clip filmed by Maribel Nunez uh, of a January 2019 event that I attended in Santo Domingo at the Professors Club of the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo, in which event co-organizer Roldan Marmol introduces Enerolisa. Quiero decir que esta presentación es cualquiera. Estamos hablando de la voz más alta de la música santera en la República Dominicana. Enerolisa Nunez, un patrimonio de este pueblo y así queremos que sea reconocido en este año 2019 por todos los organismos que tienen que ver con la cultura en este país desde que grabó Valen John va a pegar puede subir a cualquier tarima con cualquiera de los urbanos que están más pegados ahora mismo y también rompe Nerolisa Núñez y su grupo de salud and Nerolisa did not formally study anything. She follows in the tradition of Dominican Boudou and North Haitian Chacha lineage Boudou, where family lineage passes down specific devotional and cultural practices, loas, songs, etc. And Nerolisa captures the spirit of Afro-Dominican people seeking to recover our culture some two generations after U.S. installed genocidal dictator Rafael Trujillo tried his hardest to wipe it out. But rather than fall into the trap of dehumanizing and flattening in Nerolisa's Paolo music to folklore, People should follow in her footsteps, learn about their families and their traditions, work to dismantle Dominican anti Haitianism, and honor and care for the fullness of African spirituality as it expresses itself in the Dominican Republic and all its regional and genealogical variations. We turn to another musical example, and the background is playing San Rafael, a 2013 Enerolisa recording, where she does wake work for herself and self mythologizes. She sings about herself in the third person and stanzas to which her backing vocalists respond in devotion to Tinjo Alawe, uh, syncretized with Rafael the Archangel.
In the face of what Sharp calls an oceanic time that does not pass, a time in which the past and present verge, and that Olisa and her band invoke and venerate the king of sweet waters, the indigenous Lua Tinyo Alawe, syncretized with Raphael the Archangel, in Catholicism and many, many other Abrahamic faiths, St. Raphael the Archangel is a healer, and that Olisa states that in her village people may not be rich but they sing well, without naming names she stakes her claim, following in the tradition of Afro-Dominican musicians, singing about ancestors in the same context as the Loa, by doing wake work about and for herself, and that Olisa labors in full knowledge of her high stature as future ancestor, as well she protects and heals herself in order to continue educating and playing with her children and relatives who will lead the band down the line. Sharp notes that for Spillers, the Middle Passage's ungendering of black people is oceanic, quoting Spillers, those African persons literally suspended in the oceanic, if we think of the latter as an analogy on undifferentiated identity, these captive persons, without names that their captors would recognize, were in movement across the Atlantic, but they were also nowhere at all, unquote. In a gesture of healing against this ungendering and linking between the hold and the black womb, and that Olisa names the Virgin of High Grace, or Asili Alayla, as her mother, pledging she will follow Altagracia forever. Here she echoes a lyric she sang in a song I played previously dedicated to the Holy Spirit. Altagracia, the Dominican Republic's patron saint, syncretizes with the uh, Alayla aspect of Asili. That this latter is always erased when the state invokes Altagracia in national, commemorative, cultural, or religious contexts. In other Palo songs, such as the one by Bembecito playing now, we hear of Tinjo existing under the waters, rising up from it.
When Enerolisa sings, Oh, what a beautiful wave to ride, she invokes the twin images of one, the ship along with those captive in its hold, and two, Tinyo, the king of sweet waters, who's comfortable both at the ocean bottom and at the crest of a wave. He comes from below, having commingled with and perhaps bringing messages from those who prefer to jump overboard rather than live another day enslaved. Notably, the phrasing is not al fondo del mar, or at the bottom of the ocean, but always debajo del agua, or underneath the water. What lives underneath the water?